That video is just uh, for uh, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering uh, that is taking place this month of December. There's offering envelopes in the foyer and in the hallways uh, as well. So we'll be showing some videos of where all that goes. But 100% of the proceeds for the Lottie Moon Christmas offering goes towards international missions to help spread the gospel all over the world. And uh, so definitely a worthy cause to help support and to get behind and to give to. So again, you can just drop those offerings off in the offering envelope uh, on any Sunday morning in December as the, as the offering plate is passed along. I want to remind everybody about uh, next Sunday. Uh, go ahead and turn with me, if you would, to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, that's where we're going to be at this morning. But I want to remind everybody about next Sunday. Uh, we're going to start what we call a Second Family Sunday. And uh, this is where uh, all of the kids' church and the toddler's church is going to stay in the sanctuary for the entirety of the service on the second Sunday of every month. And uh, the reason behind that, of course, is to help acclimate the kids into regular church. And if they're saved, they're a part of the church, I mean, and they're a part of us, and they've been baptized, and, and they can worship with us. And, and we, want to, we want to raise our children to evangelize our children, to disciple our children. We want parents and grandparents to be the primary disciple makers in the home as well and so that's the that's the heart behind that is to help acclimate them to becoming just a part of the church as a whole uh, and then also to give our volunteers which do an awesome wonderful job to give them a little bit of a break and to spread out that schedule just a little bit further uh, so they don't have to volunteer so often uh, so next Sunday, it's going to look a little bit different on the second Sunday. Uh, I'm going to have a, a short lesson at the end of the music where the kids can come up here. And uh, it'll be about three to four minutes, and then they can go back to their seats. And I'll have a children's, a children's bulletin that they can write notes in and that they can color in. And uh, you can tell your kids that if they turn in their bulletin every month, they're going to be rewarded. All right, I'll just go ahead and say that. It's going to have probably something to do with food because I love food, but they will be rewarded if they turn in their bulletins, their children's bulletins on the second family Sunday every month. All right. So first Peter chapter one, and we're going to be starting in verse three this morning. We are starting a new study on living hope that we have hope in Christ that is alive and well. And I'm thankful for that this morning. Because in a world full of despair, in a world full of sinfulness and brokenness, we have the hope of Jesus. And as Christians, we should be excited about that. Especially this Christmas time, this time of year when people are starting to think and starting to evaluate where they are, where they've been in the past year, and where the Lord has, what the Lord has led them through and has brought them through. I think that this is an important time for us to just take a moment and to remember and to be thankful and grateful for the, the heavenly hope, the living hope that we have through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 3. If you found your place, let's all stand in reverence to the reading of the Word of God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. We read these words. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, You've been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls." Let's pray together. God, we're thankful for this wonderful, glorious hope that we have through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we're thankful that we have the opportunity to come to you. Lord, we're thankful that you've bridged the gap, that you have reconciled us. If we would simply respond to the calling of the gospel, God, we're, we're thankful that we have the opportunity to be saved by you. Lord, to respond to what Jesus has done for us on the cross and through the power of his resurrection. 
God, we're thankful for the hope in Jesus that is alive and well today. And God, I pray that you bless the reading of your word. And Lord, I pray that you bless our time together, that we would make much of you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated this morning. As I've mentioned, I love this time of year. It's a little interesting this time of year because I feel like while, as we're welcoming Christmas in, we're also welcoming back summer. And uh, it was a little hot out this morning, and so my, my voice is coming in and coming out with all these uh, changes in the weather and all of that good stuff. But isn't it still just a wonderful time to rejoice and to know that hope has come to be among us? Emmanuel, God is with us. What a wonderful, glorious picture of grace and mercy and hope that really is that we get to think about and be grateful for this time of year around Christmas. You know, one of the things that, that I love about ministry that God has just allowed me to do in ministry and to take part in in ministry is that when you're a part of a church family, you get to go through and you get to experience all seasons of life together. And you get to support one another, you get to pray for one another, you get, to, you get to see new babies being born, you get to see them growing up, you get to see them accepting Christ as their Lord and Savior, you get to see them being baptized. Many of y'all have seen generations of kids that have grown up and have gotten married and start to have kids of their own. And uh, then you're even with them in, in the latter parts of the seasons of life. And as tough and as difficult as that is from time to time, what a blessing it is to be able to walk with a brother and sister in Christ. In, uh, in those difficult circumstances, those difficult seasons, even, even the end of our days. But we can rejoice for those that know Jesus, for those that have accepted Jesus, even in, in the latter part of their days. But I, I think out of all the seasons of life that I really enjoy, I think part of it really is this time of year as we celebrate birth, as we celebrate the birth of Jesus. I love to see babies in the church. Don't y'all? I love to see a nursery that's just slap full of kids. And can I tell you, if you've got a baby in church and you bring your baby in church and that baby starts crying, it ain't going to bother this preacher. I'm excited to hear babies and to see babies in the church. I'd rather, I've said this before, I'd rather see crayon markers all over the nursery than cobwebs in the corners of the nursery. I'm thankful for new life that we are able to see unfold right in front of us. And what a blessing it is to see that in the life of other families and to see it in your own family from time to time and at birth was something I was when Jack was uh, being born it was something that that uh, that was kind of interesting uh, Sarah was great Sarah was just wonderful uh, but I was nervous as a cat when Jack got here and uh, I'll just go ahead and be honest with you I wore nasal strips all day just to keep the airflow going so I didn't pass out I didn't I didn't want to be that guy that everybody was tending to when the baby got here but it's exciting. It is one of the most exciting times when you welcome new life into the world. As exciting as that is, could you imagine the moment and the occasion of the birth of Jesus Christ? Hmm. Man. As exciting as it is to welcome grandchildren and to welcome children into this world, as exciting as it is to see new babies fill the pews here at Second Baptist in Cedartown, to be a part of our family here at Second Baptist in Cedartown, could you imagine the momentous occasion in the history of the world when Jesus Christ was born? There had been a, period, there had been a period of time where God had spoken to the nation of Israel. There's a Messiah that's coming. Christ is coming. He's coming to take away the sins of the world. There's a greater promise that's coming. There's a greater sacrifice that's coming. There's a greater covenant that's coming. He tells us this over and over and over again. Micah chapter 5, we read these words. But, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Zechariah, we read these words. Rejoice greatly. O daughter of Zion, shout, daughter of Jerusalem, see, your king comes for you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And then we read here in 1 Peter that because of the coming of Christ, and then the death of Christ, and then the resurrection of Christ, we have living hope. Hope that is alive. On Wednesday nights, we're talking about the end, or the end part of 
the Old Testament, the latter part of the Old Testament, where, where those prophecies in some ways had kind of started to slow down a little bit, I guess. And, and then there was that period of 400 years where God just didn't speak to the nation of Israel, and they just waited, anxiously waited, anticipating the coming of the Messiah, knowing that today could be the day. And then one day, hope was born. <laughs> Jesus Christ came and dwelt among us. I'm thankful for this living hope that we have in Jesus. What a beautiful picture of grace. Hope is alive and well. I want to I point to this. If there's one thing that I want you to take away from this morning, it's just simply this. My main point is simply this. That hope is an interesting idea, but, but the world may define hope in a different way. We have to be able to understand exactly what we have in Jesus, the hope that we have in Jesus. So here's my main point. The hope that is offered by the world is temporal and insufficient. The hope that the world talks about, that, that they may try to cling to from time to time, that they may try to define or to try to give purpose to their life, if it's not in Jesus, that hope in the world is temporal and insufficient. But the hope that we have in Jesus Christ is eternal and complete. The hope that we have in Jesus is eternal and complete. There may be things that this world tries to look at, and tries to categorize as hope, tries to define as hope. There may be people today who look at certain things or look at certain people in our society today and they say, I can trust this, I can trust this thing, or I can trust this person, but we need to understand and know this hope in its purest sense is only found through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There is no hope outside of Jesus. The hope that we have in Jesus is eternal and complete. We can see that's the heart of the message that Peter is delivering and he's writing about. Even from the very beginning, this is what Peter is talking about. That, that you don't need to put all of your trust in the things of this world. Put all of your trust, put all of your hope in Jesus. Really from the very first verse from this chapter, we can read this. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion. To the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. There's a lot that we can tell just by the heart of Peter's message in that first verse. He writes to these Christians and he signifies them, he characterizes them as the pilgrims of the dispersion. He's writing literally to those chosen sojourners. That's another way we could put it. Sojourners of the dispersion. Another translation would call them exiles. Christian, this is, this is what we should be mindful of today. Christian, if you are a believer and a follower of Jesus, you've committed your life to Jesus, you are a temporary resident in a foreign place. You're a pilgrim passing through. And as much as we may enjoy this world, as much as we may like the things of this world, and as much as we're grateful and thankful for the blessings that God has given us, maybe in our work or in our family or in our home or our cars or whatever it is that God may have blessed us with, can I tell you this, Christian, at the end of the day, you're simply a pilgrim passing through a foreign place. And we don't put our hope in those things. We put our hope in Jesus. Another way that we can say that. Is simply this. There is nothing of permanence in this world. As much as we may think we can rely and trust on certain things in this world, as much as we may think that there will always be those people that will be there for us, as, as much as we may think I'll always have this job or, or this institution will never fail me, as much as we can think we can, we can put all of our trust, all of our hope in the things of this world, the, the Bible tells us clearly that in one day everything in this world will pass away. And the only thing that will stand the test of time, the only thing that will stand the test of time is what we read here in 1 Peter, is the word of the living God. This message of hope, this message of salvation is the only thing that we can fully put our trust and hope in today. There is nothing of permanence in this world. So a couple of things this morning I want us to look at about this hope. And just to understand that this hope is living hope today, tomorrow, and forever. That we can always trust in this hope no matter where we are, no matter what we're going through. 
But a couple of things I want us to look at what Peter says about this living hope. Number one is simply this, is that nothing is able to corrupt this hope. Nothing is able to corrupt this hope. Look with me, if you would, at verses 4 through 5. We read this from Peter. To an inheritance, this hope that we have in Jesus, this living hope that we have through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible. And undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You know, we can look at stories in history to understand that putting our hope in the world or the things of this world really is a fleeting cause. When we think about putting our hope in, in, in the institutions or the things of this world, there really is no purpose to it, especially when we look retrospectively at things and we look at history and understand that we can't trust in so many of the things that we surround ourselves with. And I look in particular, look at, look at the Civil War. Southerners had figured out a way uh, in some ways to make it economically, but the government needed money to help fund such an expensive war in the middle of the Civil War. There wasn't a well-rounded industrial economy in the South and and Southerners weren't too fond of raising taxes in the South. So what are they to do? And what did they do in the South in the middle of the Civil War if they needed to fund this war, but they didn't have the tax revenue in order to do it? What did they do? They printed more money. And they kept printing and kept printing more money. And honestly, it sounds an awful lot like what we're doing today in our society. But, but they kept printing more money. They said, well, if we can just, if we can print our own dollars, if we can print our own confederate dollars then we can fund it and then at the end of the war when we win the war we can make good on our promise and we can build ourselves back up economically but by the end of the war when the southern states had lost the war the value of a hundred confederate dollars plummeted to a dollar seventy six and that means that the rate of inflation in the south was around nine thousand percent the rate of inflation now here's the lesson from that we may say, well, that was 150 years ago. Of course, we've learned from those things. Don't put your hope and trust in just some printed money. But how many of us today look at that little green thing in our wallets and we put everything we have, put all of our hope, put all of our trust in somebody that died 200 years ago that's on the, on the front of a bill? And can I tell you, that's just like anything else in this world. Eventually, it will all pass away. And the only thing that will last the only thing that will stand the test of time is the word of the living God. Eventually, people, institutions, your work, the government even, the physical things of this life, eventually all of those things have a shelf life and they will pass away. Nothing lasts forever. But the hope that we have in Jesus, Peter says this, Number one, this is a relevant and an indestructible hope. This is a relevant hope. He says to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. He says this is a living hope. It's alive and well today. So here's the wonderful message of the gospel. It's not that something happened 2,000 years ago and we read about it and we study about it and we say, man, that was wonderful, but it was 2,000 years ago. Here's the wonderful thing about the gospel. The gospel is alive and well today. Jesus is still alive. He's still changing lives. He's still molding hearts. He's still saving sinners. Amen. And because of that, we have a hope that will never go away. It's still relevant. It's still indestructible. This hope, this inheritance is incorruptible, undefiled by the world. But then I get excited about this, if I ain't already excited. <laughs> I get excited about this. We have a reserved hope. Look at what he says. This inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. There is nothing that can change this hope. It will never fade away. It will never, never go away. But it is reserved in heaven for you. Those that have believed in Jesus. Those that have responded to the message of the gospel. Can I tell you? It ain't got nothing on layaway and rock mart. This is, this is reserved in heaven for those that are going to come and accept the message of the gospel. It's laid up for you. And then one day... It's a revealed hope. Who are kept by the power of God. There is nothing that can separate you from the hope and the love of Christ. 
You are kept by his divine power and his divine authority. But then one day, through faith for salvation, it is ready to be revealed in the last time. We can read the word of God, and we can study the word of God, and we can get an idea of what this hope really is. We can come and we can experience salvation, and we can come and respond to the message of the gospel. We can come and we can sing and we can praise the Lord, and we can worship his name. We can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in this day and in this age, and how wonderful of a blessing that really is. But can I tell you, it is nothing in comparison to the hope that we will be revealed in the last day. When we stand in the presence of God and we see him in all of his glory, in all of his splendor, in all of his majesty. This hope, we get a small glimpse of it here on earth, but this hope will be revealed one day. And we can see just how precious this really is. So this hope that we have is incorruptible. Nothing is able to corrupt this this hope. But then secondly, nothing is more valuable than this hope. we look at verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory the revelation of Jesus Christ. Nothing is more valuable than this hope. Here's, here's what I want us to look at. I love this book of 1 Peter because as we go through this in the next four weeks, there's going to be a lot of practical guidance, a lot of uh, really practical areas that Peter touches on that are so relevant to us. It talks about things that take place in the home, things that take place at work or submitting to those that are over us, and, and things that take place with relationships in our own family. And there's things that we're going to look at that I think are going to be very, very relevant and very practical. But this is what we can gain from this. This message of hope for you today is valuable for where you are. It's valuable for the things that you're going through because you're being molded and shaped by those things. But then it's valuable, obviously, because what the end result is, is it results in the salvation of your souls. It's valuable because because we have been saved by Jesus. There's a process that takes place of how God molds and shapes us. And there's value in this process. We have hope in who Jesus is. And so what we look and what we see here in this particular chapter is that when we go through difficult circumstances, when we go through difficult times in our life, what we do as a Christian is we go back and we cling to the hope that we have in Jesus. And when we go back in those difficult times and we cling to Jesus, here's what happens. Jesus gets us through those difficult circumstances. And what's the end result? There's value in the end result of all of this because he says this, Peter does, that the genuineness of your faith, because it's much more precious than gold that perishes. Though it's tested by fire, though when you trust in your faith and in your hope that you have in Jesus is tested by fire, it may be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So this is what happens. When you go through difficult times as a Christian, hope strengthens your faith. And then you take your faith and you bring it back as an offering to God. And you go in this circular motion time and time again. And can I tell you this? And and Christian, it's, it's something that we don't enjoy talking about, but it's something that we know deep down is true. I've learned more in the valley than I have on the mountaintop. I've learned more in the most difficult circumstances of my life than those times when everything was going perfectly. And Peter's telling us that. Listen, because when you're, when you're going through life and everything's going perfectly and you don't have to worry about anything and everybody's getting along because they always do and work is going great and your family's going great and everything's going wonderfully and God is blessing you, when everything is going along, here's what happens for us as human beings. We stop to rely fully on the divine providence of God and we start to rely on ourselves. And so God says, to teach us a lesson, To show us, to mold us, to shape us. He gives us difficult circumstances. He refines us in so many ways. And he tells us, go back to the hope that you have in Jesus. Cling to that hope. And time and time again, he'll get you through it. And matter of fact, it'll be valuable. Because the genuineness of your faith will be growing. And that in and of itself is more precious than gold. Nothing is more valuable 
than this hope that we have in Jesus. Can I tell you this? If you're going through a difficult circumstance and you're going through things and you're trying to face and you're trying to see exactly what you need to cling to and what you need to hold on to, there may be times, maybe if you're not a Christian, maybe if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're clinging to everything that you can, but man, you're at the bottom of the barrel and you can't find anything else that you need to cling to and try to hold on to to get you through whatever that circumstance is. Can I tell you, there is nothing, nothing that can get you through the circumstances of this life like hope in Jesus can. Hope will pull you through. We just trust in who he is. That is more valuable, Peter says, than gold. Nothing's more valuable than this hope. Thirdly, nothing is more joyful than this hope. Peter says, because of Jesus, you have joy inexpressible and full of glory. Look at what he says here in verse 8. I, I'm encouraged by this. Whom having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. And can I tell you, if you're here today and you've never experienced salvation through Jesus, you've never came to Jesus and said, I need to commit my life to him. I need to turn away from my sins. And Jesus, I need you to be the Lord and the master of my life. If you've never had a personal relationship with Jesus, can I tell you, you are missing out on joy that's inexpressible and full of glory. There's nothing in this life that can provide the type of joy that Jesus offers. Man, we try to find it in a lot of places. We try to look in a lot of different places. We try to look in a lot of different people sometimes. We try to cling to our spouses. We try to cling to our kids or our grandkids. We try to cling, many of us try to cling to our work. And we think that we can, we can be fulfilled through our work. And we can put all of our hope, all of our trust in our work. And we can receive joy from that work. But can I tell you this? There is no thing and there is no person that can ever fill the void that only Jesus can fill. Only Jesus can bring true hope. I like this quote. By Charles Spurgeon. Says, you say, if I had a little more, I should be very satisfied. You make a mistake. If we were not content, if you're not content with what you have, you would not be satisfied if it were doubled. And how true that is. How much hope do we put in our stuff? How much hope do we put in our homes, in our cars, in our possessions? in our 401ks, in our retirement accounts? How much hope do we put in all of those things? How much hope do we put even in our spouses or those that we love or those that we're close to? And the truth of the matter is sometimes the only hope, we know the only hope, true hope that we can find is in Jesus. Peter says we have this joy even when we can't see Christ. Because of the hope that we have in Christ, we can still love him even if he's not right here. But you know, it's not as if we're putting our trust in something that doesn't exist. Because there's a couple of different ways that we can see evidence of this hope. And we may say, well, we're clinging to something that we can't really see. We're clinging to something that, you know, Jesus has came and he died and he resurrected, but he's, he's not here right now. And some may say, well, we're clinging to something I can't see right in front of me. But there's a couple of different places we can see evidence of this hope. First is the physical evidence of this hope. And that's what we read about in the Bible, that Christ came and dwelt bodily among us. Aren't you thankful for that? That he, Jesus could have came any way that he wanted to, but he came and he experienced life as you and I experience life today. He experienced persecution. He experienced temptation. He experienced the beatings that led him to the cross. He experienced pain. And through it all, he handled it all perfectly. But Jesus came and dwelt bodily among us. He became as one of us. So there's the physical evidence that we can go back to historically. And we can see Jesus has came and he's dwelt among us. But then there's also tangible evidence of hope. Even if, it, even if Christ isn't here physically in front of you and in front of me, there's still tangible evidence of hope. Because he's given us the Holy Spirit as a gift. And can I tell you, the Spirit is just as real as the Son. The Holy Spirit is here dwelling among us even in this very hour. This hope is still alive. 
so we can trust it. We can go back to it and we can find joy in it, inexpressible and full of glory. Lastly, there is nothing more rewarding than this hope. Nothing more rewarding than this hope. This hope is alive. The hope that we have in Christ will never die. It's available and it's everlasting. And the call of a Christian is to die to self. But here's what is really a wonderful picture of grace. In us dying to ourselves, we find life in Christ. This hope is rewarding. And there is nothing more rewarding than experiencing life because of Jesus Christ. We're called to give it up We're called to turn away from our sinful ways. We're called to turn away from our preferences and our desires. We're called to turn away from our will and turn directly to God's will. But the reward of doing this and embracing the hope that we have in Jesus, the reward for doing this is we give it all over to the Lord and God gives us salvation through Jesus. Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith. The salvation of your souls. Can I tell you, there is nothing that you could have done or I could have done to ever obtain salvation. There is nothing that could have bridged the chasm that we could have done between creator and in his creation. There is no offering that I could have made. There's no sacrifice that I could have done that would have paid the price for the sins of the world. There is no hope for salvation unless there is Jesus. And how rewarding it is to know that through Jesus we can live an abundant life here on earth and we can live an eternal life in heaven. I love how, and this hymn has spoken to me in so many ways over the years, but I love how this hymn sums it up perfectly. I want you to sing it with me. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he pray together. God, we thank you. Lord, that this hope that we cling to is not distant and in the past and foreign. This hope that we have and that we can embrace is alive and well. And God, because you're alive, because you're among us today, We can experience life everlasting. We can experience hope that lasts today, tomorrow, and forever. A hope that will never corrupt. A hope that will never change. A hope that will never fail us. God, in the midst of adversity, in the midst of sinfulness, Lord, when we turn on the TV... Lord, when we open up the newspapers, when we pull up Facebook, we're surrounded by brokenness. But God, we thank you for the everlasting, living hope that we find in Jesus Christ. God, maybe there's somebody today, Lord, that you've sent the Holy Spirit to deal with their heart. Lord, you've moved in their life. You've 
convicted them. You've shown them of where things need to change. Lord, maybe there's somebody today that's at the bottom of the barrel. Lord, and they've searched everywhere. Lord, maybe there's somebody today that, that's searching for answers, that's searching for a solution, that's looking, God, for what you would have them to do in their life, or they're looking for something they can cling to, something tangible, something real that they can hold through because they're going through one of the most darkest hours they've ever faced. God, I pray that you would show them, that you would be real to them, and show them there is hope in Christ. God, I pray that they would turn to you, Lord, that they would turn away from the things of this world, and they would turn to you. God, I pray for those maybe that are professing followers of Jesus, but Lord, maybe they've just forgotten how beautiful, how wonderful, how merciful this hope really is. Lord, that we've done nothing to earn it, <laughs> but you freely give it. And Lord, maybe they just need something to get them through today, to get them through tomorrow. Lord, maybe they're searching for answers for something in their family or something at their work. God, I just pray that you would speak to them, that you would show them we can put all of our trust in you. God, when everybody else and everything in this world will fall away, and Lord, eventually when people disappoint us, or Lord, when things disappoint us and they vanish right in front of our eyes, God, we know and we can trust and we can cling to this fact that we can put all of our hope in you. This hope perseveres. It endures, and it's everlasting. It will always, always be there. God, will we put all of our trust in that hope today? And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together as we sing, as we respond?